a la chance d'avoir avec nous euh, Johanna Manandrescu, donc euh, qui est euh, une directrice de recherche à l'INRIA et qui euh, lead le, enfin qui, qui manage l'équipe euh, CEDAR, qui manageait avant celle qui s'appelait Hawk, donc c'était une évolution, voilà. Donc euh, Johanna, elle, elle est un peu spécialiste d'un sujet qui commence à nous intéresser à l'IRT Systémiste de près euh, sur euh, des, des montages de projets qu'on a en ce moment. On en, on en a déjà un peu parlé ensemble. Euh, donc c'est des sujets de données euh, structurées, semi-structurées, euh, voire hétérogènes, complexes en tout cas, et avec en particulier les outils du web sémantique. Et elle va aujourd'hui, euh, donc elle, a, elle, a, elle est vraiment dans la communauté VLDB, euh, à Sig, à Sigmog, euh, Sigmod, Sigmod. Pardon, et, et 3E Data Engineering, je crois aussi, euh, bien connue. Et, euh, et on est content de l'avoir avec nous pour donc, ce séminaire où elle va nous parler de... Computational fact checking, donc le, le, le sujet du, du, de la détection d'événements, et voilà, enfin, elle va vous en parler plus, mieux que moi, et donc euh, je suis content qu'elle puisse faire cet échange avec vous. N'hésitez pas à l'interroger sur les problématiques qui vous semblent résonner avec celles que vous avez vous dans, dans les projets. Voilà, je lui laisse la parole. Merci. Um, anyone here strongly prefers that I speak English? Ok, good. So uh, the presentation will be in English for the sake of the gentleman there. Um, I'm going to give you uh, what I call a content management perspective on journalistic fact-checking. So if you want uh, it in three or four words, it's data management for journalists. And I'm going to first motivate why I took interest in this, because as Patrice said, my home community is just data management. So what's the thing with journalists? And I'm going to, they say you should tell your own story because it's a story you tell best. And uh, this is a picture from Romania where I grew up. This was 1989, just one month before the end of communism in Romania. This was the 14th Congress of the Romanian Communist Party and the slogan there reads that Ceausescu re-elected at the 14th uh, Party Congress. You can picture that there was only one candidate and he just kept getting re-elected. And this is bad because he had been in power for 24 years. 24 years is a long time. And uh, this is another view of the same Congress room, but from the opposite angle. And if you notice something interesting here, the delegates are seated, but you have these white streaks between the, the seats. And these white streaks are school children that were taken out of the schools and which had to enter at specific moment, wave flowers and sing glory to the party. And I know because I was there, they took us by the bus load, several classes, and we had to skip school for two months for to rehearse the way that we are going to march and sing and wave the flowers. My parents tried to talk the school into letting me off the hook and they said, no, 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 it's of the highest political priority. So I had to go. So these are things that you don't like. And of course, at the end, a few kids got to bring flowers to the great leader and this kind of thing. So this is, this is where I grew up. Um, nobody likes this and the Romanians didn't like it anymore either. So soon after those black and white pictures, we had this colorful, um, let's say, outburst of freedom where people got out in the streets and said, uh, uh, the universities, the physics department, and the other uh, universities here, they all wanted freedom, and this was better. Now, <laughs> what is bad is that Romania is the only country from the former Eastern Europe where to get from communist to democracy cost 1,000 human lives. There were 1,000 people dead, one way or another, mostly shot, and there was no conviction ever, so nobody really knew who killed those 1,000 people. Um, so we got freedom, but it cost some human lives. So uh, all of this to say that my generation and some generations before grew with the idea that the democratic society should absolutely have free press. We want to be able to debate and dissent, because if we cannot dissent, then we have something like this with the 13th and 14th Congress and so on. Uh, we want to also be able to analyze, confirm or refute public statements. If a politician says something, we want to be able to check whether it's true. And this is what is commonly called fact-checking. And more largely, we want to investigate what's going on, even if it's not just to say somebody is a liar. If it is just to understand. We live in complicated societies, and it's hard even for well-educated, well-meaning people to understand how everything works. I used to say, you can take a look at your pay sheet, and I'll pay you money if you can explain every line in your pay sheet. People who work in the accounting departments are not allowed to take this. But, but generally speaking, modern societies are complex, and the free press is, I believe, the best we've got, we come up with, trying to explain how we function, uh, so that people can make more informed choices. 
I want to say that, of course, data journalism and journalism at large is not only concerned with who got killed, and not only for dictatorships, we have obvious uh, well-known applications such as the Panama Papers analysis, where a lot of um, tax fraud was exposed through data journalism, which is simply journalism used on important uh, large-scale and or very interesting numerical data. So let's try to separate clearly these three domains that are closely related, data journalism, journalistic fact-checking, and fake news detection. You can see that there are joint elements, but they're not the same. This is an example of data journalism, uh, which we can define as investigative journalism based on data that is complex and or is large. This is a picture that I took from Le Monde. They published it a few years ago. It shows over a period of 20 years the evolution of salary, rent, and average cost of life. This is, these are the curves at the bottom. And this is the cost of a house that pre-existed. So if you buy a new house, it's even more expensive, right? Because new houses are built to higher standards. So you can see that something has been going weirdly in society over the last 20 years. And if you put all these prices to a common 1.0 20 years ago, now we are here. So this, when you see this graph, you can immediately see that something is happening, something that needs explanation, something that may need social correction. But before you get this pretty graph that says everything in one glance, you need to get a lot of data. So this is what I call one successful example of data journalism. Data journalism also allowed us to realize, for instance, that our own Minister of Economy, Jerome Cahuzac, was connected to a company which uh, had a um, representative in Panama, which is where the money was hidden. From a database perspective, this is a graph of data. And as soon as you've got this graph of data, you can ask interesting queries, such as give me all the French citizens who are beneficiaries of a trust such that the trust is located in Panama. That's a very simple database query, and it does a lot of interesting things. Now, fact-checking is a different uh, task. It is the task of verifying facts that appear in media content. Typically, this used to be done within media rooms, within newsrooms, before publication, so that the newspaper doesn't publish anything false, because they run the risk of uh, losing their reputation and maybe losing a lot of money if somebody calls them to court for defamation. So there is this citation from a person that worked as a fact checker at the New Yorker, and he says the day they hired me, they gave me one set of red pencils, and they gave me proofs of article, and I had to read the articles and scan for things that could be checked. This already shows you that not everything can be checked. For instance, whatever is a sentiment or, or a kind of poetic uh, phrases such as on such a bright spring day when flowers are in bloom, blah, blah, blah. Nobody checks that. What you check are, for instance, things such as who was elected when, to what office, how much money something is worth, these kind of things. We'll come back to more examples. But what you see here, this person had to find passages that could be checked and then had to check them with the help of reference book from the magazine library. So the magazine library had a bunch of books. This was certainly pre-internet. And the person had to go and look into these books uh, to check if the facts that were claimed in the articles were correct. So this was fact checking as it is done in the media since the 30s. Now, as you probably know, since 2012, this task has on one hand exploded online with claims being made online and fact checks being available online. And especially most importantly, instead of being done pre-publication by specialists, it is done post-publication. So we have politicians or other important or visible people who speak to the media, and somebody runs after their statements and checks them after the fact. Okay, so the task today has changed from a form of quality control within the media to something more distributed between people who make claims and many others who try to confirm or, or, or um, prove them wrong. For instance, here, we have some examples taken from uh, factcheck.org, which is an NGO from the United States, which started in 2012, mostly with, uh, with uh, uh, private gifts of money, which is taking statements that are made by various politicians, such as the Democrats supported the border wall. And then you have a human that looks at the statement and that consults a bunch of references, which are documents online. And the references are included as links in the analysis. 
And at the end of the analysis, this journalist will use one of these icons. This is a visual language that they more or less uh, pioneered and that everybody more or less uses, which shows that there is a whole spectrum between something that is exactly true as stated, something that is mostly true, maybe with some exaggeration or just a small uh, mistake, half true, mostly false, false, and special category, especially for President Trump, pants on fire. So as you can see, the analysis is not always very easy. It's not always black and white. Uh, this guy who says, we don't understand why so Democrats are so wholeheartedly against the wall. They voted for it in 2006. He just got a misleading because the Democrats did vote for something that was more or less a wall. Okay, so it's not totally fake. It's an exaggeration. It shows that the complexity, it shows the complexity of the task. And one reason the task is complex is that you start with natural language. So because you start with natural language, there's already a lot of debate of what exactly that, uh, that claim meant. But let me not anticipate. Um, there is a common uh, streak between fact checking and data journalism in that most aspects of modern reality are complex and explaining what happens can be at least as useful as checking. In particular, if somebody is making claims about the future, by definition, those claims cannot be checked against the reality because we cannot make the future happen, not now at least. But what we can do is work with the data and make projections. So for instance, these are uh, some projections published by uh, The Economist that are trying to figure out what happens uh, depending uh, what happens, what is the impact of the Brexit on the GDP of the UK percentage points and how, what is the cost per household. So this again is data journalism. It's not really fact checking because it's made on, it's based on projections, but these projections don't come from thin air. They are based on past statistics and on the current situation, on some current trends. So there is some data out of which the journalists extrapolate. So as I said, there are several aspects of reality that are very complex, such as the impact of something on the GDP. <laughs> we all know there are so many factors at play. So the question is, do, you know, does the public really need to understand? And the nice quote that I found uh, recently was going, populism is telling people that there are simple solutions to complex problems. Therefore, I think as a society, we need to do at least our best to understand. And people need to help us understand, because otherwise we are voting and we don't understand what we're voting about. Um, you have certainly seen uh, news such as this one. The news is not necessarily good. W I believe and several people believe that more education to the issues and to what's going on is a serious uh, help to save what we have as a democratic system that, you know, in particular, some people die to have. And my best guess for that is the free press. And if we don't like them very much, what I can say is what's the alternative. So I'm, you know, I'm still going with the press. Good. Now, let me just check one last item. The difference between fake fact checking and fake news detection. Fact checking is based on some background information source. Remember the books, the books from the reference library, okay? If you don't have a background information source that you check in, there is no check possible. Because if, there's, if it's just my opinion versus your opinion, we cannot check. That's not check. It's just disagreement. Um, so we need a truth commonly agreed upon, at least a truth that the fact checker believes. Fake news detection, on the other hand, it may not even use a source. So how, could, how can you detect fake news without a source? By other aspects. Think of fake news detection as a classifier problem. We have two categories, fake and not fake. And uh, we uh, train a machine learning algorithm that looks at a lot of examples, positive examples, negative examples. And after a while, it learns what are the characteristics of a fake news item. And it actually works. There is a gentleman here who explained that he trained a, a program that had a huge accuracy on, on uh, detecting fake news. And he just trained it on the style. Because professional journalists are educated by journalist school to write in a nice way with nice phrases and choose their words carefully. Whereas many fake news are clickbait with uh, shocking titles with three question marks, with all caps, with disgusting, you'll never believe, amazing, these kind of things. And the AI algorithm correctly understood that this kind of shocking terminology and style are typically attached to fake news. Of course, this model has some applications, but you can see also that it's very easy to fool. 
I mean, if, if I give any of you half an hour, you could write a perfectly uh, well-written text that says that Angela Merkel, whatever, wants to invade North Korea or something. So it is possible to do it, which just serves to highlight the difference between some fake news detection technology that do not need to take the pain to go look for the facts and the effort of fact checking. OK. So what is the typical scenario that people fact check? One kind of common uh, question is, what is the value of metric x in space y at time t? So you can have x that ranges from unemployment to number of illegal immigrants to budget of research, these kind of things that can be measured. We can put a number on it. And y can be a geographical unit, could be a country, but could also be a city or an arrondissement or whatever you have. And for the time, you can have a year or a period or, again, whatever uh, unit you want to take. There are many applications here. You could think of the uh, organic agriculture. You could think of the concentration of harmful gas in the air. Okay, Many things that are of social impact can be framed in this way. And you can also fact check comparison patterns, such as x1 is larger than x2, or uh, y1 uh, is uh, different from y2, or you can check a temporal trend. People can make statements such as, the GDP has uh, grown by two points due from 2005 to 2016. That's something we can hope to check. This is written somewhere, so we can hope to check it. Uh, some examples that I'm taking from Le Monde. Uh, nice uh, visual um, representations of some fact checks. How much money the French state can spend per habitant per year? This is 6,700 euros. How much money the European Union gets to spend per citizen per year? This is 300. OK, you see this conveys a message. Huh? Um, this is an interesting analysis that shows where do immigrants that come to France, where do they come from? And you can see that the difference between those that come from Africa and those that come from Europe is very, very small. So people always think of people coming from Africa. But in fact, there's a lot of migration within Europe. And actually, it turns out to be almost as large. Um, Another class of scenarios that are very amenable to fact-checking are uh, statements. Who said what when? For instance, we can check that somebody did or didn't say something on a given topic at a given time, possibly at a given time. If you don't want to hear about the time, you may be interested to know what the person had said on that topic along the time. Because if he or she said uh, different things along the time, then it's interesting to know. Um, apparently, briefly, Trump has said that he believes that Russia did meddle in the election. And then he said the next day that he just misspoke, and in fact, he meant that he did not. Nobody knows. Um, other kind of interesting questions are, is something or somebody related to someone else? You can think of it as, is there a path in the graph? Is there a path in the knowledge graph that tells us that you can go from here to there? And by what way, by what path? And you probably have seen that Mediapart had been uh, working for a while trying to figure out if the former French president Sarkozy was uh, involved in some way with Gaddafi, the former Libyan president. And they said this for several years, and they didn't have the last piece of evidence. And the last piece of evidence came very late, maybe just one year ago. They found somebody gave them a document that comes from the official, appears to come from the official uh, administration of Libya, which is a kind of signed statement that they will give 5 million euros to Sarkozy's campaign. So Mediapart had rumors about it, but they didn't have the proof. And very late came the missing link, the missing document that allowed to connect somebody who was somehow connected to Sarkozy to somebody who was somehow connected to Gaddafi. So the missing link basically came pretty late. A similar problem of missing links was uh, used to understand who is hiding money in Panama. And in particular here, a uh, graph database was built from two data sources. One of them was a database of people who served as a straw men in Panama, who were representing different companies from other countries. And the second data source was a set of PDF files, which were the contracts through which each of these representations were being put in place. So we have two data sources. One is a tabular, one is text, and people working for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. They put the two together into a big graph. And once you have the graph, then you ask graph queries, and all is very easy. OK, 
So these are the kind of scenarios that we are interested in. And let's look at them from a content management perspective. And what I have been uh, doing with a set of colleagues that will be mentioned through the last years can be basically uh, decomposed in three axes. The first one is of modeling and understanding. We want to look at fact checking and model it as a data or content management problem. Uh, then we want to understand which of the tools and techniques that are available today can be used as they are or could immediately be put to task in a special journalistic context. And wherever we need new tools, we should devise new models, tools and techniques in order to help people perform their data uh, journalism and fact checking tasks. So I have done this work over the last uh, four years, maybe a bit more. Uh, we started with some support from Google together with Xavier Tanier, who was a maître de conférence in LIMSI and now is a professor in Paris. Over the last uh, four years especially, I have been uh, coordinating an INR project with uh, several colleagues from the universities and also with a fact-checking team of Le Monde. These guys are called Les Decodeurs, whose uh, graphs I borrowed so far. Um, and also I have been supported by an INRIA associated team that allowed me to collaborate with a former PhD of mine, Julien Leblay, who is a researcher in Japan, as well as uh, some colleagues from um, University of Lisbon that just hopped in even though they were not sponsored because they were interested. Um, this is one of the first diagrams that we came up with and I will explain what uh, the boxes mean. Fact checking starts typically with some media content. It can be an article, it can be a blog post, a tweet, it can be the transcript of an interview. In the media content, we need to extract the claims. Claims are what can be checked. Remember the red pencils. Some people extract the claims as text, uh, a small phrase. Some people extract the claim already as data. You can think of RDF triple, something that starts to be structured, predicate subject value. Um, the claim also never comes in a void. It comes in a context. The context is where this was published. Who says that? When was it published? What is the source? What are the evidence? What do we know about the author? If you know that a piece of uh, a statement comes from an elected person from one political party, this can bring some kind of background that can help you understand what he says. Once we have the claim, some human actors, typically journalist experts, or you can even ask crowd workers to do this, use some verification tool. And there are different interpretations here. But you can think of it as a kind of query answering or question answering system or even approximate query answering, because sometimes we find only approximate evidence for what we're looking for, we'll compare this claim with some input from the context and with some reference sources. And the reason why I'm showing several of them is that obviously there are many data sources out there. Not all of them are good as reference sources because not all of them are trusted, and trust is very important here. And another practical problem is that we do have to deal with many, many information sources. And this raises some problems that data management people identify as data integration, because you may have different pieces of evidence coming from different data sources. When the verification has finished, there will be an analysis result, which will typically give a diagnosis, one among the several categories that I've shown. Um, we'll write some text for humans to understand the analysis and typically should give their own sources. So they should say, this is false as it can be shown by reading that. Or as shown here, this is true. If the fact check doesn't give its sources, it's just adding to the noise, so it's not helpful. Okay, so once we understood that, we figured that work which has been done by colleagues in many labs in many, over many years could actually be used for the specific tasks at hand. First, and really still very importantly, is claim extraction. Claim extraction is an NLP task, because we always start with the text. And this is between hard and incredibly hard. <laughs> so some things can be solved today, but it's still far from being done, because, because we, we need perfect NLP and perfect NLP, you know, not, not, not yet. Um, with respect to the context analysis of a media, claim, social network analysis, detection of communities, detection of trends, of propagation, this has a lot to bring. So this is one class of techniques that can be very helpful here. A big uh, area of work for data management people is to try to uh, construct the sources, refine them if they're needed, 
As I will show, there are some sources which are incredibly high quality from the perspective of their trustworthiness, but from a technical perspective, they're crap. I'll, I'll get to that. Another interesting problem is automatic source selection. If we find a claim about unemployment, maybe INSEO has the appropriate reference data. If the claim is about music albums, INSEO doesn't, is not concerned with that. So a different source should be selected. This question of source selection has been handled in um, uh, data integration scenarios in federated databases, also in web search and in several other scenarios. If you have several humans that give their opinion about the same problem, you may have to somehow reconcile the, the answers. You may have to unify them or, or, or confront them in somehow. And this has been studied in particular when uh, tasks are delegated to crowd workers that you don't know personally and whose analysis you have to uh, reconcile at the end. And of course, what is interesting to observe is that the result of an analysis will typically be stored, persistent, and shared, and will become a reference source, supplementary reference source that can be used in the future. This actually happens a lot. Um, most fact-checking efforts that I mentioned so far are completely manual. And once a human has written such a thing, there are many hours of work that went in there. And then these things are indexed and reused by other fact-checking systems, which also works because rumors have a tendency to get recycled. It is hard to come up with a new idea. But you probably all already have seen an image that has been recycled in a different context, which was maybe wrong in the first place, or maybe true at the beginning, but then wrongly reused. So uh, people who work at this seriously, for instance, the decoder, they build databases of fake news. And the first thing they do when they have a doubt about something, they just run it through the database that they already have because they know there's a high chance you find it there. OK, so trying to do this systematization and this analysis that I try to show here uh, graphically, we wrote a survey that appeared last year, which you can find online. We have plenty, plenty of references. I do not get into the details, but I'm happy to point you to the survey. And we gave uh, two tutorials based on it last year. And all the material is on the website of our project, uh, contentcheck.inria.fr. OK, so now let's try to think of how databases can help this uh, fact-checking and data journalism uh, work. And the first problem that we were confronted with is that historically, journalists <coughs> don't do databases. <laughs> they do not build databases because they view themselves mostly as writers, not technical folks. This is starting to change, but they view themselves as, as creative professionals that know how to spin it, that know how to write, that have good writing skills, not, you know, they're not database administrators. Um, and we were uh, astonished to discover that the simple fact of persisting data that you use to write an article, yeah, why should we persist it? <sighs> Come on, keep it, man. So, so even convincing them to keep it in the Google Drive, you know, you need to tell them because they, the paper is out anyway. If ever they want a job, they have the article is online, so the article is their proof of, of, of having done something uh, important. So uh, it, is, uh, it is catching on, but it was not obvious at least four years ago. And I have to say also that in some uh, media companies, the information system that they have is not helpful either. So there are systems that barely archive and index their own articles, such as they were published online, but without the images. Only the text emits. <sighs> there are systems that ask the journalists to manually categorize every article in at most four categories. And it's a fixed set of categories, and that's it. And if you want five, when you're tough luck. Um, there are some special uh, exceptions here. Uh, we have an ongoing project with West France. And this allowed us to learn that these people had a hell of an information system. Uh, here you have a poster they proudly display in their, in their hall next to Rana, which shows that they are by far the most widely sold journal on paper. You may ask, you know, who cares about paper? But actually, it's a large part of France who gets their morning paper and likes to read it. And this is, this is across Europe, I think. I'm not sure. No, maybe just France. In any case, they have a huge distribution. And one of the reasons is that they have regional editions. So they have 54 regional editions, 54 of them. And they publish in the regional pages incredibly detailed information about what goes on, even in a few uh, small hamlets. 
And we had a crazy story when we asked them, th so they, they, they wanted to work on a database of uh, conseiller municipal, so people who are elected to the city council, even of very small uh, towns. And I said, where does data come from? And they say, well, there are official, official notes of meetings and elections. So we know which person was, which councilman was present when, blah, 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 elected when. And I said, where do you get that from? And they looked confused and they said, we publish them. I said, yeah, you publish those, but how do you get them? And they looked confused again and they said, well, our man is present there, so he takes notes and it becomes official when we publish it. So West France is the reference source for a lot of local life in their area. They are the reference source, okay? So this was amazing. So West France has a database of what, what goes on in their area, which is truly outstanding, which is top notch. They have ontology, they have data catalog, they have change management, they have views, they have everything. But they're really a singleton. I, have, I haven't seen many people with such a huge information system. And what do they do with it? Well, they uh, say they want to sell some data services. So for instance, they want to make a vertical everything about ship and shipping industry. So now they have all the data about shipping companies for the last 30 years. They know who's who, who was the chairman of what, who is in the board of what, what got sold, what got bankrupt, what got whatever. So they have a lot of information and they try to sell data services around it. But it's really an exception. Now, if you try to convince them to build databases, uh, one problem is what I call the curse of the coverage because a general newspaper needs to write about almost every topic and it's hard to tell them to have a database about everything. Nobody has a database about everything. And also, if you think of um, global ontologies such as global knowledge bases such as DVpedia or Iago, these do not have coverage of tiny details such as what goes on in a village when somebody resigned from the municipal council because blah, blah, blah. They also have a curse of the noteworthiness. They have to write about what is hot now and they do not have the leisure of, most, most of them do not have the leisure of completing a study with a lot of time and going in depth on one issue when they have to write something for tomorrow. And they work under strong time pressure. But what is important, and this was true across the set of people that we talked to, they are extremely picky with their data sources. So what a journalist calls a reference data source is much, much stronger requirement than what a data management person says, I have a database. Yeah, you have a database, but who wrote it? Where does it come from? Is it up to date? They're very, very picky. Um, they like sources that they can trust, especially if they know where it comes from. But on the technical side, the problem is that sources that they trust can come in many different data formats, HTML, JSON, Excel, XML, CSV, whatever they can find. Mm. They told us at some point that they have the list of everybody elected for local uh, offices across the country because a helpful lady from the Ministry of Interior sometimes give it to us during her lunch break. So they know somebody who is kind enough to take the time to give them this list, which is, should be open data. It's not a secret. It's just that it is not out there on data.gov. And somebody needs to do it. And they know this lady from the Ministry of Interior. And sometimes they go see her and they get a new version of the data set. And typically it's Excel. Uh, um, they don't write queries and even when they get their hands on some data, they typically don't know what they're looking for, which means that generally they would love to get data exploration tools, and that's something that's really helpful for them. And very importantly, the fact-checking process and the result must be explainable. So they cannot come to their audience and say, this is false because the machine learning algorithm said so. This is not usable at all, at all, at all. They want to have a proof, something that a human can read, understand, and possibly be convinced by accept. So something that we did over the last few years with a PhD student that is finishing this year was to improve the conditions under which one can use the data sources of INSEE. So INSEE is a French statistic institute. It gathers very high quality data. However, it publishes it as a set of Excel tables that are embedded on HTML pages. So they published currently about 70,000 data sets that are online. And each of them is a set of Excel tables surrounded by some text. And their search engine is really not good. So if you search for something on their website, it's better to just look it up through Google. 
And even through Google, you not always uh, find what you're looking for. So what we did was to extract the data from all the tables that INSEE published, put it in RDF, and then search inside uh, in a much more uh, user-friendly way. In particular, if people would uh, search for some keywords such as uh, enterprise creation 2015, we may come up with this, uh, with the data from this spreadsheet. We found, um, sorry, yes, so we found enterprise and creation in the label of the data set. We also find creation and France here. And because we understood that this was a table, we will actually look into the structure that came from the table and try to return directly the number to the user while also showing the link to the original spreadsheet online as it is on the website of INSEE so that people can manually check and put the source if they want to publish an, an article about uh, a fact check that carries over this kind of thing. So this work is trying to help fact check statements of the form metric X in territory Y in period Z was such and such. And more recently, just accepted last week, we have a short paper where we automate the task of extracting statistical claims from text. So this is a machine learning effort that goes over the text and tries to understand where the text is trying to assign a value to a metric in a space, possibly in a at a time. And these three pieces put together, they provide a pipeline that attempts to extract the claims from the text, check them against the insert data, and show the result to a human user that can choose to write an article about it or not write an article about it. Something else that we've been doing last year and that I keep working on is to try to improve access to data sources that are heterogeneous that could be used for fact checking. So in this situation, we consider the case where there are several data sources that we trust. One of them is giving, for instance, the list of the uh, elected people at the French National Assembly. And this you can get in JSON format on a site that is called nodeputed.fr. Everybody can get it, it's open data. This is a journal officiel uh, which publishes the list of students admitted every year at Ecole Polytechnique. This is text, it is very trusted, it is the journal officiel. And it publishes the name and given name of every student admitted every year. And you can assume that you have a company of, a database of companies where you know the president of every company. And then somebody wants to ask if there is any connection between the political party En Marche and the company that is called Areva. And what our prototype does, it interconnects these heterogeneous data sources by noticing that uh, in the deputy document, Anne Martin is said to be elected for the party En Marche. And she was admitted at Polytechnique at the same year as Philippe Varin. And Philippe Varin is the president of Areva. So what the tool does is a kind of poor man's link data. And why I say poor man is that we do not assume and we do not hope that we have primary keys that allow us to link things with certainty. We assume that we are getting a bunch of data sources and that we are trying to find matches based on common entities that co-occur here we found Anne Martin, so we are confident 1.0 that is the same person. Of course, this may have some errors. It may not be the same Anne Martin. And here we found an approximate match between Philippe Varin and P. Varin. And we still accept it because we consider that the similarity is high enough. This was a small prototype that we developed last year. And of course, we want to continue working on it because there are many obvious ways to improve it. For instance, one thing we want to do is to give the possibility to anchor such kind of loose connection finding to a database, a graph of trusted knowledge if you have one. So if we have one, which for instance could tell us that there are two different Anne Martin, then we would even try to attach these references to the right Anne Martin using whatever context elements we can find. Another question that we, we discovered is that in this example, of course, there is only one connection, but in reality there can be zillions of connections between two or more entities. And an important problem is how to rank them, which are important. If you find that two people, two French politicians, you know, what do they have in common overwhelmingly? If I'm asking you what uh, Mélenchon has in common with uh, Sarkozy, they must have something in common, right? 
If you ask Libipedia, they have in common of being French. Yes. Oh. And they are male, both of them. Uh -huh. So this is true, but it's not interesting. So an important problem is to rank results. You find connections. In this case, these are connections between two entities. But some connections are true, but worthless. Then they don't deserve attention. What is noteworthy? And there are several metrics for the noteworthiness or interestingness of a connection. In fact, this generalizes because we allow the system to handle connections between an arbitrary number of entities. So you can name three or four or as many you want keywords. So this becomes a problem of ranking Steiner trees. You're looking for Steiner trees in the graph. And there are many me metrics that we are still exploring and playing with. And in particular, I managed to get Fabian Suchanek interested. He's a guy who created Iago. And I'm trying to see with him if we can pursue this together, trying to continue a bit on the line between extraction, graph management, knowledge basis, and ranking. Another work that we're doing, we are starting to get some results on modeling who said what when. So we have a small workshop paper coming up uh, maybe one or two weeks from now. The general model first accounts for facts. So we call fact something that holds according to a database. How do we know it's true? Don't ask me that. I don't know. It's just we allow you to declare a set of things as true for real according to the database. But then we allow the database to also record the statement of x about f. This is not f. This is just that x says that f holds. It's just a statement. And higher level statements, such as y said that x said that f. Okay, And uh, facts in this model, they can be specialized in whatever your application requires. It can be about uh, carbon dioxide. It can be about weapons sold to Saudi Arabia. And statement, again, can be specialized in as many brands as you want, such as writes, says, declares, tweets, so on and so forth. And with this model, you can analyze what people have said. And you can trace a lot of interesting information, such as what did the person say about the topic along the year? How did information propagate? Who mentioned this first and when? To whom did he mention it? How did the other person learn about it? So you can ask some information propagation questions that are nice here. And more generally, thanks to recursive queries that allow to find paths in the graph at any distance, you can try to find out who has heard of what when. This is the general, uh, the general model that we put up in this work. What we did not do by the time of this paper was to actually populate the models for extraction, because it's nice to have a model. But who's going to actually, ex you know, statement extraction is a nice and NLP problem by itself. We have had some new techniques that uh, Duke Kao has proposed. And we have uh, an ongoing submission, which worked reasonably well for what we had. Um, overall, the lessons that I think we learned through all these uh, attempts to work with journalists and try to see what their problems are. The first important question is to work with the right data. Work with the data that humans trust. There are many mechanisms for certifying data, perhaps. That would be good. You know, We trust that when websites are secure, we put our web uh, credit card if we trust it. In the database communities, there have also been efforts to build knowledge bases by harvesting facts from the web. And you get into things such as we found uh, somebody's birthday, we found three different dates. Most sources agree it is on that date, so we are going to believe that date. And that's not what journalists work with. So journalists cannot rely on the result of a majority vote. They cannot use that as a source. They are taught that that is not acceptable. So in fact, what they trust is data that comes from the right actors, the right organizations, the right people. But they have to work with the data as it is, even if it's heterogeneous, because they never get the time to do extract, transform, load, and take care of the data, and design a warehouse, and the schema, and all these fancy things. And they are always on the run because they don't have enough time. And generally, the operations that we found they are most often doing is to extract structure and connect, extract structure and connect. They're trying to put it all together through, from originally a set of heterogeneous sources. And as they are still not techies, even though some of them start to get pretty good with tools, they would like to be able to use keyword queries, simple query paradigms, data exploration. 
And if somebody can, of course, if somebody can make them a web interface where they can put a few keywords and understand what will happen and just use it, they'll be happy. This is why they were not extremely happy with us because we looked at their questions and said, OK, let's put this up as a research problem and try to think about it. And they said, can we have it next week? I said, no, you probably cannot have it next week. No, it will take longer. Uh, but we follow each other's ideas and uh, they have, we have shown them some of the tools. Uh, probably they can try them again in a few weeks when we have another meeting. Uh, they're just running like crazy after the, after the next thing all the time. Okay, so for some perspectives of this work, if the system will work with me. Um, there's a lot of computer science research that is applicable to fact checking. And it comes from several areas. I certainly feel strongest about databases, but clearly we also need knowledge, uh, and, um, knowledge and reasoning. We need information retrieval. We need um, natural language processing. And this is the important point that uh, hit us mostly, is that in the most general statement of the fact-checking problem, if you try to automate it, you need to start with having perfect understanding of the text, and this doesn't exist. So you need to give up on this and try to work on sub-problems that are doable. Um, what is important is that we believe in the end, it's not a result from the machine that should be up there, but something written by humans. Because journalists are people who are trained to write so that you want to read them. And they choose the topic, the angle, the style. And I like to say that fact checking is a story wrapped around the query. <laughs> so at the core, there is a query or some approximate search there. And then there's a whole story about it. Why should I care about it? Why is it important? What did the other people say? And so on. What I'm hoping for is to try to build perfect data machines. So we try to build the tools that can help them extract information from their trusted sources. You tell me what the source is, and we'll work with it and then give them to people who know how to write. I have looked for um, technical content that would come closest to what we believe they need. And I found a work from 2005 by uh, Franklin Halevy and Meyer. They called it data spaces. And the data space was this idea that you have a system that can eat data of any nature, relations, semi-structured, graph, unstructured, text, knowledge base, whatever. Just throw it in, throw it in, and the system would store and index it, and would support search across the data through all these kind of different data sources. The follow-up work that they brought, I th it's not 2017, sorry, it's 2007. So the follow-up work that they did on this was keyword search in a sense that you ask a few keywords and the query will be matched against every data source individually, and you will get all the results. The difference with what we did uh, in connection lens is to build answers across data sources. And this is still something that is not done in the previous, uh, previous works. There are many close ideas that are trying somehow to exploit all the kinds of information that we have. And we had a paper with a PhD student in uh, the lab next door in 2016, where we tried to put together um, text and RDF graphs and, and uh, structure text and the social component where you would ask a keyword query and then it would bring you the results that are also scored high because they come from people somehow close to you. This was still very much a computer scientist view of the, of the problem with uh, you know, um, exponentially decreasing social distance as you go farther from the source. This is something that makes sense for us, doesn't make sense for them. So for them, the source is really a hard, it's a zero or one, uh, how to say, problem. Either you can use this source or you can't. And, and, and trust is not very much transitive. You know, if I don't trust it, I will not publish something that's based on that data. OK. Um, what should the journalist data space support? It should support a lot of things. So there's a lot to hope for. It should have good support for time. First, the data acquisition time, and also the time of the events described in the data. Fortunately, I have uh, seen a few tools, NLP tools, that are very good at time extraction. Heidel time, if you work in NLP, you probably heard of it. This is a pretty good tool, so this problem, specific domain problem, which is let me extract mentions of time moments, this appears to be pretty well solved by a tool that's uh, helpfully online. We need to have very good data provenance. We need to have author metadata. We should allow users to annotate the data and the fact checks and the sources. 
because journalists have started to collaborate and many of these tasks are performed in collaboration. There should be access control mechanisms that are based on provenance and annotations because you want to share with these folks but you don't want to share with those folks. Or you want to see what your colleagues from your newsroom have annotated or shared but you don't want to look at the other guy's stuff. What we came up very naturally is the ability to derive content. So if you have this data space, which can be seen as a data lake or data swamp, depending on the level of optimism that you have, you may want to say, OK, find me the stuff that is related to the CO2 uh, market. And then put it here, and then I just focus on this. Right? So just try to get, take partial results, put them somewhere, annotate them, uh, do work just on them. Semantic annotation, classification, some analysis of social connections, they're pretty, uh, pretty interested in this. And of course, nice interfaces and scalability and many things. Um, there's also, of course, a part of the roadmap that concerns society. If we want to help journalists actually have an impact and convince people of what is true and what is not, I found uh, this very nice. It's a game called uh, getbadnews.com. I recommend you play it, it's free, you can also show your kids. So you, are, uh, you have a web application and you start playing and they teach you how to write fake news. So it's pretty uh, ed educative. At some point it says, okay, you should buy more followers on Twitter. How much money you have? Let's buy more followers on Twitter. So you know, after you, you will go through this once and you kind of feel a bit vaccine. Um, I have seen that France is actually pretty well, um, well placed among um, let's say, evolved countries in the fact that kids get an education to the media and in the internet where they are taught in uh, secondary school what can you trust, what kind of sources are there, is this ad, is this politics, is what is this? So, so this is an article in the New York Times which envy, uh, envies us. And this is a journalist showing to a class an example of a story where it is said that a Belgian guy has painted the flag over his front shield and he doesn't see where he goes because he has a flag painted and therefore he uh, parked the car in a tree and uh, she's uh, working with the students so trying to get them to have a critical spirit and analyze if this can really take place as described. Um, people have asked uh, me sometimes, you know, is this worth it? I mean, you're doing all this uh, nonsense and some people will never be convinced, you know. Some people will always say man hasn't been on the moon and the Twin Towers haven't been a uh, victim of uh, airplanes and so on. And uh, yeah, I will say um, this is true. Some, some, some people will never be convinced. That's fine. Uh, there's this well-known uh, quote by Paul Krugman, facts have a liberal bias. Uh, so there is a part of reality that, uh, that will stay uh, probably with folks that are uh, rather well-educated. And this is something that I, I was pointed to more recently, which is kind of um, discouraging, but I think it's important to see. So this is a guy who was a professor in Berkeley. I think he, w he was working on, um, on uh, the mental processes. So he was, uh, he was working on how the brain works. Okay. And he says, scientists and even humanity scholars believe that humans yield to reason. That if you show arguments and you force people to do modus ponens, then it will, they will reach the same conclusion. Business people know that this is not true in general. Business people know that people react to feelings, that it is through feelings that you make somebody feel good, feel happy, buy your product, feel insecure so that he or she buys your product. So business people know that humans do not in general yield to reason, and therefore they have an advantage when they enter politics because they do not base themselves on the misconception that humans yield to reason. So I think this is, this is true, and it's somehow discouraging for people who do what is called hard science. But the good news is that there's uh, an active community of social scientists that are working on this social side of the business. So they are analyzing how can you emotionally convince people, or at least how can you give them the emotional tools to resist manipulation. Of course, it's an ongoing battle, but it's worth fighting. And this is also important to remember. There was a study done by some psychologists a few years ago who showed a bunch of people a set of claims and asked them to say whether they kind of believe it or why they definitely think this is false. And they found that people who believed conspiracy theories they have no problem to believe things that are totally incompatible. So they ask people if they believe that uh, Lady Diana of Wales, 
died in a car accident, was killed by secret services, or maybe she's alive and hiding somewhere so that she can leave her love affair quietly with her boyfriend. And people who believe that the secret services killed her also believe that she's alive and hidden. It's the same people. So this is important for us as a sanity check to understand that uh, in the technological community we may have a, you know, a liberal bias and you know, a logical bias and everybody doesn't have it. And a psychologist when shown this, for them it makes perfect sense because people who believe one conspiracy theory do not believe it on the merit. They believe it because they tend to think that what the media says is false. So whatever the media doesn't say may be true. So this doesn't come from facts, it comes from feelings. It comes from the impression that they are anyway being lied to in the mainstream media. So their endorsement of conspiracy theories, even totally contradicting, makes sense for them. Okay? Okay, so that's as much as I had to say and thank you. Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, two, two questions. The first one is uh, concerning the fact that you are uh, able to create facts in the, uh, at the end because you're no, you create claims. Uh, yeah, claims because you're you're able, for instance, to link people uh, related to each yes, other yes. and to and you want to to, to mark the north uh, worthiness of it. Yes. So it means at the end you can have big and fact to, to to show to the world yes. automatically. Yes. Is it I don't want to show them automatically because I always believe that these are data machines and journalists should decide if they want to make something out of it or not. Yes, yes. But I, I, think, I think we should give them better tools because the, too much of this effort is currently manual, including parts that today's technology can automate. So I'm just trying to, to help the discussion on both sides of the community bridge the gap, point them to tools and build systems whenever there's something new to be built. Uh, my second question is more global, mm. like linking to the end of the, the talk, yes. uh, concerning the, the truth on, and, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, the, and the, the, the global impression that the, the problem is relative to the, the uh, truth, like what is true or false, and, and the idea is that people have a, a relative relation with truth and false, mm -hmm. and, and so my question is, is it a good answer to, to, to answer by this is true and this is false, instead of uh, uh, um, uh, insisting on the, the facts that are related and how you say that, okay, this is not true, but this is true according to this source. And, yes. and, and just to show the link more than show the, that this is true. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. All the, all the journalists that I've talked to that do fact checking, in particular Le Decodeur, who really insist on it, they want to give the discourse. They don't want to give one, zero, or one. They absolutely don't want to give zero and one. They explicitly, so they volunteered to me that if somebody claims that uh, whatever unemployment is 2.8 and it's 2.6, that's okay, that's not newsworthy. 2.6 is fine, okay? What is much more important, for instance, is for them is to debunk the difference between uh, correlation and causality or, or to when something is blatantly false. There are some pretty subtle examples. Several years ago, Claude Guerin was a minister of interior and he said that something like half of the kids that fail in French schools are immigrants' children. Hmm. So, so this was very interesting and the Ministry of Education after a while started to say wh where he gets his numbers from? Because we don't have the statistics. Who's counting immigrant children in France anyway? Since when are immigrant children counted? You know, I feel affected, I'm an immigrant. Did they count my child? What's going on here? And after a while, after a while it came up that this was a misinterpretation and exaggeration of the PISA study, which is the only formal uh, whatever you know, global as an assessment of school capacity and there they mistook uh, the fact that one parent is born abroad or something like that for being an immigrant child. Okay, so, so, so journalists totally agree that it is not a matter of zero and one and I also try to convey it and we, do, we should not give zero and one to people. We all agree on this and the journalists are the first ones to agree. We should give them something uh, more complex and you know, problems are complex, explanations are complex. I totally agree with this. And I also wanted, I think there was a point here, the point that I tried to make about the future. I think uh, Roosevelt, or I don't know whom, said, uh, you know, prediction is hard, especially when it's about the future. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. So, so the point is, there are a lot of things that are complex and need explaining. I totally agree with you that it's not a matter of zero or one. However, we should, I believe, insist on the idea that 
There is a truth on some aspects, at least on some aspects. You know, if you ask if somebody loves someone else, that's a complicated question. You know, what is your ground truth there? But if you're counting immigrants, dead people, or concentration of carbon dioxide in the air, that's something that can be agreed upon. And we shouldn't give up just because some people are <laughs> illogical. If you remember in, uh, in 1984 of Orwell, at some point they say, we should make them accept that two and two gives four and everything else will follow. So, you know, as long as two and two give four, we should stick to two and two give four and, you know, repeat it even if it's boring, even if some people don't, you know. We should find new, way, new ways to convince them that two and two give four and the rest will follow. <laughs> yes? Just to add uh, uh, next to the, the scale of the, uh, how, true, uh, how true it is, uh, another one, which is how much a fact it is, like a checkable fact. Uh -huh, I see. You know, like to, to scale. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes, yes. And sometimes what we have seen also is I, I talked to a guy from the Wall Street Journal and he told me that ever since the American media started to fact check politicians very heavily, their communication uh, spin doctors uh, taught them how to speak ambiguously so that they could not be as easily caught to uh, precise statements that you can check. We also got one company who wrote to us and said, oh, we are a public communication uh, enterprise. We work with uh, opinion leaders. We would like to talk to you. I didn't answer. I just got one such email. Yes? I wanted to know whether you, uh, you met issues with uh, having uh, data in your data space. Uh, because usually journalists like to uh, keep their data secret for a while up until they publish the article, so did you need this issue? Um, we have, uh, so uh, clearly there are data sources that they didn't want to give to us and they, for instance they participated in the either the Panama paper or another one similar and they said you'll never get the data. It has the home addresses of people. If one of them gets his home bombed, I have the right to have this data because I'm a journalist and you don't. <laughs> and you don't want police at your doorstep to ask you what did you do with the address of a corrupted politician whose house got uh, blasted. So there is some data that they will never give us. But what I re really motivated us is that there's a wealth of data out there. There's a wealth of public open data out there. There are m miracles you can work with this data, if only if it was accessible and easy to use. Uh, there have been, um, 10 years ago, France put a lot of money to save the auto industry. You know, we know how much money it was. It was public money, so it's written somewhere. And we also have the job statistics. Who made the comparison? How many jobs it was supposed to save and how many jobs it saved in the end? There's a lot of stuff that, you know, can already be done with open data. But I agree that journalists have special rules for accessing data. They can have more data than I can have because they are doing a special job. So, so I, I didn't even try to force, you know, getting sensitive data. I don't want sensitive data. I'm a technician. I'm doing my stuff. Tools that they could use, basically. Create tools where I could just tell them, you know, you drag and drop your file here, and after you drag and drop sufficient files, you will be able to find connections between people you didn't realize were accountants for two companies in a row, or, you know, were the wife of someone and the secretary of someone else, or this kind of thing. But is it possible to centralize all this data in, a, in one knowledge uh, base? It is possible to build a platform that would absorb as much as you give it. The implementation we have so far is centralized, so I will acknowledge that you know, this is not Google scale and doesn't claim to be Google scale. What I have learned from the Panama Papers investigation is that these things would perfectly fit on a laptop. It's not a problem. Right? You just need to join PDF with tables. So PDF, extraction, nodes, graph, join tables. That, that's what's happening, basically. So Connection Lens was very much inspired by that because Precious data sometimes is huge and sometimes is not that huge, but it's still very precious data. Uh, it is one of the things that we hope to do with Fabian to move it on a parallel implementation so that we have more uh, scalability. I wonder. <laughs> Wait, no, please. Um, are there a uh, initiative in the uh, in the US, in yes. England, yes, and uh, what are they looking at? Is the same thing at you? So uh, there, are, um, there are some folks, uh, uh, Kong Yu notably, who I think now is in uh, Google, 
And uh, Jun Yang, for which I think is from the East Coast somewhere, but I always forget the name, but I can give you the point as if you want. They studied something very interesting. They studied claim sensitivity. So they say, for instance, let's say somebody says, um, Giuliani said, D when I was a mayor of New York, adoptions went up by 20%. And this is important for a population of New Yorkers who don't have time to make their own children and want to adopt. And, you know, getting the procedures to be fast is a good thing. And then what they did is they took all the adoption data, which is public, public data, and they shown that it had been growing up before he took office and it continued to grow after he took office. So the claim, as stated, was strictly true. Between 2000 and whatever and something else, it did go up. But if you move the claim a little bit down and a little bit up, it's still true. So this is true, but uninteresting, OK? So this is what other people who back background is in, the, is in data mining, they said, OK, this is the claim quantified. And is it sensitive to par changing in parameters? OK. Other folks uh, from uh, UT Arlington, they built a system that is called Claim Buster. And Claim Buster does claim extraction from text, and then automatically matches it against four different data sources. One of them is Ask Google. The other one is, I think, an ontology. And one of them is the system known as Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha is a general qu question answering system that covers both theorems and physics laws and the kind of knowledge base a little bit like the, the, the whatever, DBpedia, Wikipedia. Um, and they do it fully automatically and return something with a score, which is good for computer scientists, but uh, I think journalists are not buying this. And uh, also, because they uh, look in different sources, you can get different results. So you can say, OK, these are just four results, but one of them is the web. So it's a kind of glorified front end to Google. But anyway, the what, the, what their, their pride is, is having a fully automated system, because it does everything by itself. But what I have seen in their demo scenarios are issues such as, is Obama the president of the United States? Well, yeah. His. So, so, so I'm not sure. It could work, but I'm not sure of the reliability and what are the hypotheses under which you, you know this works. Um, there, is, uh, there are also some interesting efforts from uh, journalist departments. There is something called the International Fact Checking Network that is uh, hosted at Pointer in the US, which has uh, paid a bunch of people that are mostly journalists but also look into. Uh, into uh, fact-checking and automating and other using computer tools. And there is a, a British NGO that's called um, Full Fact that raised $5 million. And they said they were building a system that will do everything and coffee. And I, mm, they, they have written a beautiful report two years ago saying how they were going to, we have to follow. I don't remember. You know, I, I, I haven't heard back from them, let me put it this way. But they had the money, and they certainly had at least one smart technical person that I talked to a few years ago, Mevan Babakar. She seemed very competent, so maybe it should be checked out what they did since. But they are kind of secretive, and they try to sell it. So I'm not sure how far, how far they are. It's harder to figure out exactly what they have. We surveyed many of these things in our, in our, in our paper. So, so there are some uh, efforts. Uh, actually, it is. Much easier to do the CS side of it than to actually work with a journalist, because there's such a distance between the technical level and requirements and what CS people like to do. So there's still uh, some distance to be covered there. Um, any idea about the uh, image on and by and the video can be uh, contents can be uh, used with this kind of tools uh, and and with. Uh, Complementarity. For example, uh, Benara say that uh, he, he never uh, use uh, an arm and, and find a, a photo. Yes. But uh, it's sometimes it's long to, to find the photo. Um, so, so the first thing is whether photos or videos can be faked. Of course, they can. If you have so, so, so th there is a. I will just tell you Invid, I N V I D. This is a EU project led, I think, by uh, AFP, uh, France Press who is uh, specifically focused on uh, detecting forgery in image and uh, video. And there is also Vincent Claveau from IRISA, who works on this very successfully. 
and they can detect uh, image alteration patterns. So they basically they can, you know, you f they find these uh, sudden jumps in the color of the black, you know, what kind of black this is. Ah, <laughs> looks like a copy paste, these kind of things. Um, so this is one question. I haven't covered any of the video or, or uh, image forgery here because there are totally different host of techniques. So you need to understand signal processing, do some machine learning uh, that is related to, to video. And so, so this is not covered here. For sure, you can use both. Uh, the video, the image of Benalla with a gun pointed at the head of the waitress, I think comparing that image with a stock image of a gun is easy. I think that's like, you know, really easy. So I think current technology allows to compare image similarity and say that what he's holding there is not a water pistol. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said it was a water pistol, actually. Yeah, he did say that. So this, I think, can be solved today. Other than that, so, so what I have here mostly focus on, on non-image, non non-video data, for sure you can combine things. So for instance, if you're looking at a media article, you can uh, grab the images that are inside, submit the images to special verification, and use it as a complementary indication of, uh, of uh, the truthfulness of the, of the article. And uh, the question, uh, the, the agency press, uh, IFP, Reuters, etc. Uh, give us some depeche mm -hmm. um, and uh, is there a uh, textual uh, version is there an xml version of this uh i believe so yes i believe there is or you can ask because they have been partners in so many projects that there are annotated corpora okay. uh, my colleague from portugal she knew about an annotated corpora of le monde text i mean if uh, if she got it from portugal so that we trained the model on it and you know it's doable yeah Okay. One more question? So, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank